Dr. Matthew Carlson and welcome to Osteopathic Clinical Skills. Today we're going to do an introduction to the basic tools of your trade. We're going to start, after my cameraman pans down, back up to me, hello up here, thank you. All right, we're going to start on the far side over here with our stethoscopes. These are two different kinds of stethoscope. They're both made by Littman. Um, I like Littman stethoscopes. It doesn't mean you have to get one, um, but I like their single tube design because when you get the sprog type, which has a two tube, those two tubes can rub against each other and produce artifact. When you wear your stethoscope, important things to remember is always make sure that when you look at this, you can see that there's a turn to the earpieces so that when you put them on, you want those pointing towards your nose. So they always go in a forward downward angle. Um, I encourage people not to carry these around their neck because if you expose it a whole lot to oils and stuff like that, it'll actually start to degrade your tubing. Um, and also it's a really easy thing for an irate person to grab and garrot you with. Things that are other important parts are this stethoscope has a dual head. One has a bell and one has a diaphragm. The bell is used to listen to low tones, like when you're listening to heart tones the, or a bowel sounds. The diaphragm is more commonly used when you're listening to higher pitch tones um, like lung sounds. The way that um, you know which way this is going is that when you turn it, if you'll notice on this one, let's see if my one, this one, actually, that's funny, it doesn't have it. So how do you know it works? That you've got to turn to the right one. You put it in your ears and you gently tap, gently tap. That's the easiest way. Some of them will actually have an angle to this piece. Some of them will have a little dot. And when that dot is up, it means that the opposite side is the one that's functional. This is another Littmann stethoscope. This has what's called a self-tuning head. A self-tuning head means that when you put it in your ears, remember your piece is pointed towards the front, that depending on how much pressure you put on it, if you put it on it lightly, it functions like a diaphragm. If you press firmly, it functions like a bell. So those are our stethoscopes. Um, the next piece of equipment we're gonna look at is your blood pressure cup or your sphygma manometer. Just spell that word many times, it brings me joy every day of my life. It doesn't matter what your sphygma manometer looks like, but it will have single items that are common throughout all different types. If you notice, here I have a adult extra large, an adult regular, a small adult, and a child. You wanna make sure, I can demonstrate here on the small adult, that when you put this around the patient's arm, that the Velcro goes within this range. The reason that you wanna make sure of that is because if it goes outside of the range, you will either get, if it's on too small, you're gonna get an artificially elevated blood pressure. If it's too big, you're gonna get an artificially low blood pressure. So you wanna try and make sure that you match the size of cuff to your patient. The other parts are gonna be tubing, a bulb to inflate your cuff with, and then a release valve. Now, I often get asked the question, how do you know which way to turn it? Well, lefty-loosey, righty-tighty. So when you turn it that way, it's gonna close it. When you turn it back the other way, it opens it. Another way you can do it is if you pump it up and it just keeps on pumping and you hear air releasing, then you know you have to turn your dial the opposite direction. The other part is gonna be your dial, which is gonna measure your pressure in millimeters of mercury. Whenever you give a report off, you wanna make sure that you're saying 125 over 80 millimeters of mercury. So you're remembering that that is your unit because as you remember from back in college, without units, measurements aren't nothing. All right? And we'll be covering how to put it on and so forth uh, in the lab. Our next piece of fun equipment is our tuning forks. The most common one, these ranging from a 4096 hertz to a 128 hertz, which looks like this. The one that we're going to most commonly use is your 258, sorry, 256 hertz. 
And the way you activate this, some people will tell you that you should smack it on your palm or smack it on somebody's head or on a knee or on the patient's knee. Personally, I just like doing this. Snapping my fingers on the end of it, it gives you a good tone. You're not smacking anyone or smacking anything. And this can be used for vibratory sensation over a bony prominence. It can be used for doing hearing testing when placed against the mastoid process. It can be used for sensory of hot and cold because they're this type is made out of metal. So if you're able to put it on somebody's hand, they can give you sensations as well for not just for vibratory sense, but for heat and cold as well. Our next piece of equipment is your handy dandy reflex hammer. This one is one of the better ones to use because it has a bit of weight to it. You want to try and stay away from the ones that are all plastic um, because of the fact that they're really hard to swing. You'll notice that on this side it's got a little point to it that this can be used in testing for uh, motor neuron reflexes. If this was someone's foot, it's where you drag the tip of it across the foot for a Babinski reflex. You'll learn about that in neuro. Um, and it also has a little bit of weight because when you go to use it to do your strike for your reflexes, and if you notice how I'm doing it, you want to thwack it. And so having a little bit of weight on the end makes it a whole lot easier to do if you, if you have that. You want to stay away from the ones that are called the true neurological assessment ones. Um, that look like a barrel on the top of them. The triangular one is the functional one you want to use. You'll go, hey, Dr. Carlson, why is there a pen on the table? Uh, get yourself a good pen that you like um, and get a lot of them or steal them like I do. Uh, you just want to make sure you have a good writing device. The next item on the uh, cavalcade of equipment here is a pen light. Um, a flashlight or a mag light or a floodlight really doesn't do. If you'll notice as I shine it on my hand here, you'll notice that it's bright enough to see details, but it's not really bright enough to like blind somebody. They do have ones that look similar to this that are LEDs. I find those to be a little bit bright for when looking into people's retinas or if you're looking for pupillary reflexes. Although a brighter one when looking inside the oral pharynx might be a good thing, you want to try and stay away from using really bright lights in people's eyes. This one has an automatic item where you just push it down and then it goes off. It helps save the batteries. It's disposable. You can find these in almost any medical goods store. The next item that we're looking at is called a monofilament. We use these for during neurological testing for fine touch sensation. The reason we use a monofilament and not other items is because when you press on this, it has a predictable amount of force that bends the monofilament. Whereas if you're using like a cotton wisp or something similar to that, it can be any variable amount of force, but this is a predictable amount of force to make that bend. And that's all the force you need to, when you press it on someone's finger or on toe and saying, can you feel this? Now this is one version. Another version comes in a single use. That was a multiple use one. Make sure you wipe it off with an alcohol prep, but if you're using the single-use device, notice that it's got the same kind of monofilament design, but the cool part about this one is it actually gives you instructions on how to do the monofilament exam on the back side of it. You can usually get these in boxes of like 20, 40, 50, um, and they are considered to be single-use devices. This one happens to be made by Medline, not that I make any endorsement of this particular product, um, it's just that's the name that's on there. You can also get um, like a multiple box that has a bunch of them and you'll notice also on this one it shows the picture of how to do the monofilament exam on the bottom of the foot. You're going to be using that monofilament exam on the bottom of the foot when you're doing a diabetic neuropathy test or diabetic foot exam. Moving along now on to our otoscope. Now this is a otoscope that's made by Welch Allen. It has a nickel cadmium battery in it, which is rechargeable. The way that you set it up, and please make sure that on the first day when you come on to class that you've charged them. So you take this top piece off and you stick this into the outlet. You let it sit for at least 24 hours the first time you're gonna charge it. 
The cool part about this set as well is that if you take these pieces apart, you can add this special ring, which then allows you to use standard batteries in it. So you can either use the rechargeable or you take these parts apart and put the standard batteries in it. Do remember that you don't want to lose this. And if you're using the nickel cadmium side, you don't want to lose that collar. I'm going to put it back together with the standard nickel cadmium and demonstrate my incredible manual dexterity. So with your otoscope, other moving parts of this that are important to remember is not to cross thread it. So when you look right here, that's the on and off button. When you press it and you rotate it, the button it stays down, that means it's on. When you press it and rotate it and the button goes up, it means that it's off. The best way to do that is to make sure that your otoscope head is attached and then you simply wave it across your hand to see if you can see a light. But do practice with this so that you're able to hold it in such a manner that it's a simple movement of your thumb to rotate on and off. Different otoscopes that you may have purchased will have different on and off items to it. Make sure that you're familiar with the particular one that you're utilizing. This otoscope head has a adjustable optics. So your eye is gonna look in this side and you will turn it either up or down to bring into focus. What I do recommend is that you figure out what you need for your eyes and look through the device at the back of a, a feature, either a blood vessel or like a mole on the back of your hand so you know that up or down, you can kind of set it up before you go into a person's head. Um, it's kind of annoying if you're in a person's head and you're doing this because it can be really super loud. Make sure that you're using speculum covers if you look at the size of this one, there are variable sizes and use the one that's appropriate to the person's head. You wouldn't put a large diameter seven millimeter one into a infant's head and you probably couldn't put a three millimeter one into an adult's head. Just make sure you're using the appropriately sized speculum for the job. It is then inserted and with a turn, locks into place. This is important because you don't wanna stick this into a person's head and then have the speculum come out and you're walking away and they're going, hey doc, there's still stuck, something stuck in my head. The way that you then change it out is you turn that and then you can simply drop it in so that there's no cross contamination. So that's the quick nuts and bolts of this otoscope head. The next piece that comes with this kit is an ophthalmoscope head and it just simply trades out in that manner. Again, with this, we're going to be using it for doing retinal exams, looking at people's fundus, their macula, looking for changes in blood vessels on the retina. And again, you want to practice either using your thumb in this manner or using your index finger in this manner to make sure that you can easily turn and turn off your device. You'll notice that there's several other functions on this one. This is a diopter changer or what allows you to focus in. You usually will give specific instructions on how to utilize this, but when you're doing it, practice moving with the otoscope in your hand as such with just your index finger to move that thing up and down because that's how you want to do it. You don't want to hold the otoscope, I mean the ophthalmoscope like this or like that or like any other weird combination. <laughs> All right. During class, we'll also investigate a little bit more on what these specific three items. So if you wanna look this up and study a little bit, that would be something to look forward to on which each of these is commonly used for. So otoscope, ophthalmoscope, nickel cadmium hand, or C cell batteries. Make sure that either you have new batteries or your device is charged when you come to class. The last item is a kind of a classical item. It's called a watch. Now, you will hear people that tell you that no, you can go ahead and use a phone, no, you can use the one on the wall. I recommend that everyone pick up a wrist watch. You can go and get a skeleton watch like this one, we'll let it focus in, which is really cool because you can see everything working inside. Um, it retails at about $125. Or Bed Bath & Beyond has these uh, snap watches, and this one happens to be a purple monkey. 
it's just as functional. The things that it has to have are a big hand, a little hand, and then a second sweep. You can also use a digital format watch. That's totally cool. Um, either way, you need a watch as one of your professional pieces of equipment. So this has been Dr. Matthew Carlson going over the tools of your trade, which will be introduced during the first few sessions of osteopathic clinical skills. Thanks for your time and attention.